Can you hear me okay? No. <laughs> I'll remember that, huh, Sinto? <clears throat> well, if you recall, last week we started a series on the Holy Spirit. Uh, we're going to spend this quarter uh, on that particular subject. But before we started actually getting into the material on the Holy Spirit, there was a couple of things that I wanted to go over, some foundation uh, principles with respect to studying things in the Bible. And the more, the, the more sophisticated or the, the uh, more intense the subject matter, the more important it is that we, we keep our, uh, found our basics in line and so that we don't get off on, take a wrong turn, get off wrong tangent, something like that. The Holy Spirit is one of those topics. The only, as we talked about, it, you read about the Holy Spirit. Where's the first place you read about the Holy Spirit? Pardon? Genesis. Where in Genesis? The second verse of the Bible. It talks about the Holy Spirit. It introduces the Holy Spirit because it speaks of the Spirit of God. Where's the last place we read about the Holy Spirit? Where would you think? What's the last chapter in the, whole, in the Bible? The very last one. Revelations what? 22. The Holy Spirit is in Revelations chapter 22. Talking about being throughout the book, he is, and he's working. And so it's such an a, uh, important subject, and yet it, when you think about it, if it was not for, if it was not for this book, we would, know, we would know nothing about the Holy Spirit. We wouldn't even know that the Holy Spirit existed. Except that we can read it in this book. Now, my, I, my speculation is, even when we are with the Lord in heaven, we won't fully understand who the Holy Spirit is. But we ha can have a basic knowledge of the Holy Spirit now because he ta it's talked about here in, in this book. But to get into a, a subject like that, we have to be careful how we approach the material. It's much like studying a, a prophecy. Uh, Robert uh, taught the uh, book of Daniel uh, a quarter ago. And we know how much Daniel deals with visions and such. And so we only know what Daniel tells us that he saw. But there is a lot of room for speculation. And we have to be careful as people start speculating on what could happen. What does, what constitutes speculation and what constitutes truth? I can teach, I can stand up here and I can teach truth. I cannot teach my opinion. If I teach my opinions as truth, as truth, what I have done is I've added to the gospel which John in his revelation forbade. I have to stick to what the Bible teaches as truth and not go beyond that. Any of us who are in the position or the role of a teacher, whatever it may be, a class like this or much more informal, we are, have to guard ourselves that what we teach is what the Bible presents as truth, period. Now, I'm not saying it's wrong to discuss things. I am just saying that it, we have to be careful with the routes our discussions take. When we talk about prophecy, when we talk about the Holy Spirit, when we talk about all of those subjects that are pretty deep in the Bible, that's when we have to be most careful. Now, you remember last week we start out a comparison between truth and what is called conjecture. There is a lot of conjecture that goes on. If you, what impressed me about, and I can't remember who was teaching it, but we were, I think it was Mark's class on the uh, parables. What we, there's a lot of discussion about parables, which, which is, is welcomed in a class, but if you're not careful, you can get off onto, well, if they were doing such and such, this is what that means. 
type uh, path. So you have to be careful where you go. In other words, we can teach truth, but what comes up in the conversation of classes is really a lot of conjecture. And that's what we have to be careful with. If, uh, for example, in the book of Jude, verse 6, he makes a, an, uh, just an amazing statement about what, takes, what has taken place in heaven that, again, we would know nothing about. Jude 6, the American Standard Version, and angels that kept not their own principality. What is a principality? Like a, a right, an area of responsibility, a principality, like a, a governor, like Pilate. He ruled over Palestine. That was his principality, assigned to him by the Roman Empire. But left their proper habitation, he hath kept in everlasting bonds under darkness until the judgment of the great day. Now, in the English Standard Version, it says, and the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under the gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. So, the English Standard Version reads a, a little bit different with respect to that term than the American Standard Version. Another version, the uh, New American Standard Bible, and angels who did not keep their own domain but abandoned their proper abode, he has kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day. So, those angels that, that rejected God and followed Satan in, instead were angels who had some kind of position of authority or principality, God had to assign them responsibility. They weren't just regular uh, average Joe angels. They, had, they were important in God's plan. Now, I don't know what they looked like. I don't know what their authority was. I don't know how God uh, arranged this hierarchy, so to speak, but all I know is he did. All I know is he did. Now, that verse, we could spend all day talking about it. We could go through the what do you think over and over again and come up with all kinds of conjecture. But what do we know for sure? All that we know for sure is there were important angels that followed Satan. That's it. That's where we have to draw the line. That's all we know. So that's why we have to be careful with respect to conjecture versus truth. We can rely on truth. Conjecture we ha simply have to be careful about. In Acts chapter 17, talking about the Bereans, the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea, and when they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. Now these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. Therefore many of them believed, along with a number of prominent Greek women and men. So, Paul comes to Berea, and he's preaching the gospel. And what's the main theme of the preaching that he, he does there in Berea? What is the most important fact that Paul preaches? That's true, but what's the most important fact? Jesus rose from the dead. That's the most important, that's, that's the basis of our, our faith. Well, now the Bereans are going, whoa, what's Paul talking about? What? In, is Paul preaching that is truth, and what is Paul preaching that is possibly conjecture? You see the difference? We're in the same boat as the Bereans. When someone is teaching something, we have to decide, is it truth or is it conjecture? So, what did the Bereans do? They went to where? The, they went to the scriptures. And what scriptures did they go to in Berea? Old Testament. That was it. All they had was the Old Testament. But that Old Testament talked about the Messiah, but it did not say who, rose, who was that Messiah and who rose again. That's where they start thinking, wait, wait a minute, what's Paul preaching? Maybe that's conjecture. He's saying this man, Jesus, 
rose again. Now, we know the Messiah, we know the Messiah uh, was prophesied in the Old Testament, but we don't know who that is. And all of a sudden, Paul comes to Berea and he says, well, Jesus is the Messiah. They can't find that in the Old Testament. So how did they know that Paul, what Paul said about Jesus was truth? How did they know that? How could they say, yes, Paul, you're right, the truth is Jesus was that Messiah? He compared it to prophecy, but he still doesn't, they still don't have a name. Well, Paul wasn't even there. See, and he's preaching. Yeah, so, so how do they determine that the Jesus is preaching is truth? Right, and they could see that in the Old Testament. But how would they know that Jesus was a Messiah? What did Paul work? Miracles, miracles. So they knew that the miracles that Paul worked validated what he was saying about Jesus, and now they could move from the conjecture category over to the truth category. See how that works? Now they know it's truth. And that's what we have to differentiate. We have to differentiate between what is conjecture and what is truth. And the specific is the Holy Spirit. What does the Bible say about the Holy Spirit that's truth? And what do people say about the Holy Spirit that is conjecture? And there's a ton of both. So that's all I'm saying is we're going we're gonna to be just like the Bereans when it comes to any topic of the Bible, especially the Holy Spirit. We have to differentiate between what is conjecture and what is truth. It's a learning process. In, uh, with respect to uh, the truth, this is what we might say logically deduced fact. That is, we follow a logical process to come to the realization that what we have learned is truth. Logic, logic is, it, we depend on logic. We live by logic. Uh, the Bible, God puts us, God gives us the ability to think and to uh, think logically to come up with what he, what he wants us to realize is truth. Uh, after four years of math in college, I got really sick of logic, <laughs> but, but I had to learn it. Now there's logic, there, logic exceeds what the, what the Bible teaches. There's more, all, we have to address the Bible logically, but there's more in life that we call logic that we have to pay attention to. No place in the Bible does it say two plus two is four, but that is a logical statement. You see how we, how we work, work that? So what I give, what I present in this particular class if I say it's truth, then you bet it has to be logical. It has to be logical. Now, oftentimes we get in the discussion and we talk about what we see as being reasonably rationalized. There are a lot of discussion that goes on that sounds reasonable. It really does. Now, and, it, and it's not bad, it's good. We grow in our faith through that kind of discussion with other Christians where we have to weigh what is being discussed and say to ourselves, does it sound reasonable or not? But the, the, uh, the, the problem with reason is, have you ever, I have, I don't know if you have, have you ever thought something was the way the Bible says and then as months or years or even decades later, you go back and you say, well, I think I was wrong about that. We change. We learn more. We grow in wisdom and knowledge. And so what sounds reasonable, oftentimes early on, we reject as we get older. There's nothing wrong with what sounds reasonable, even though we, we, we might put it over on this side conjecture, because we have to grow. We have to grow, and we don't know everything. We will never know everything, but we will grow in our knowledge and our wisdom of God's word, 
And so we will change. We will change in our understanding. Some things become more, some things become reasonable and, and others are not. Or down the road, we flip-flop. And I'm sure the waters are really muddy right now. But the point is, there's nothing wrong, there's nothing wrong with this trying to figure out what God is saying, and something sounds reasonable, but we, do, we cannot put our fingers on the truth of God that validates it. But like I said, there's nothing wrong with it. It's a growth process that we go through. Every one of us goes through that. So we have to weigh something that sounds reasonable and something that we know is logically deduced. And until we can put it, until we can move it from this side over to this side, we have to consider it as conjecture. In the case of, of logically deduced, logically deduced truth, there is only one option. If it's truth, there's only one thing, one concept that can be applied. In the case of what is what sounds reasonable, there may be multiple possibilities. For example, when uh, Robert was teaching Daniel, you remember the the uh, statue that Nebuchadnezzar uh, had him build for him, the head of gold, the chest of silver, the midsection of bronze, and the legs of clay and iron. Now, we could spend all day deciding, well, what does the gold mean? He, 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 uh, he assigned the four... The, the four kingdoms, Babylonian, Persian, Greek, and Roman. But why was Babylon gold? Why was uh, Persia silver? Why was Alexander the Great in the Greek Empire? Why was that bronze? Why was the lower section uh, clay mixed with iron? And we can sit around all day and we some of us probably have, and tried to figure out what sounded reasonable. Does Daniel tell us? No, he doesn't. No, he doesn't. And we come out, we, so there's, there's different, on this side, there's different alternatives. There's different options. And we're trying to weigh which one is most, most reasonable. On, excuse me, on this side, there's only one. 1 Corinthians 16, now concerning the collection for the saints as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let, him, let every one of you lay by in store as God hath proper, uh, prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. You start talking with a lip when you read American <laughs> Standard Version too much. Upon the first day of the week, which day? What's the first day of the week? Sunday, Sunday. Which Sunday in the year are we to, as he says, uh, contribute? Which Sunday? Whenever it's Sunday. So the only conclusion we can come up with is it has to be every Sunday of the, of the year because of the way it's written. There's only one option. There's only one possibility. <coughs> Every Sunday. Can't go anywhere else. In uh, the American Standard Version, it says, upon the first day of the week. It's, it, it's, it's uh, interesting division of vision, versions. The American Standard Version says, upon the first day of the week. New King James Version, what does that say? On the first day of the week. We have the English Standard Version. On the first day of, ooh, they put another word in there. What's the word that went in there? Every week, what they did is they used logic to deduce the only possible option. You see how logic works? There's only, there's, if it's truth, there's only one possibility. 
on the first day of every week. American New American Standard did the same thing. On the first day of every week. What they did is they made the jump that logic required. The American Standard and the English Standard said on the first day of the week. They understand, and rightly so, that if it's on the first day of the week, it has to be how often in the year? 52 times every Sunday. So that's the difference between, so that's how we, we consider what, what a, for example, we're reading a book about something, and an author makes a statement about a subject in the Bible. We have to evaluate. We have to say, is the author giving us truth, or is the author giving us conjecture? And a lot of times, it's just conjecture. It sounds good. It sounds good. But we have to weigh it, see if it's the truth in the Bible. Now, if we draw a conclusion that is sound, that is logical, our conclusion must be based on the fact that the text implies that. A passage implies, we infer. See how that works? That's how those two words work, go together. Something we read implies a conclusion, and we infer that conclusion by what we read. That's why we determine what is truth. That is, we've taken a text, and we've read it, and we've understand this text now implies this conclusion, and we infer that conclusion from the text. And the, uh, with respect to a conjecture, we must look at that, and if they conclude something, someone concludes something, as, and it sounds like an opinion, we have to ask ourselves, does the text, does the passage imply what that person just inferred? That's what the Bereans had to do. Paul made a lot of uh, statements. And they, they went back to the Old Testament to see if what Paul was saying actually implied so that Paul could accurately draw or infer that conclusion. So it's just something we have to be careful about because there are so many writers out there that write things that sound real good. It's not wrong to read them. It's not wrong to think about what they're saying. But is it truth? Is it truth? That's, the, that's what the brains were stuck with. That's what we're stuck with. Luke 10. The village and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister called Mary who was seated at the Lord's feet listening to his words. But Martha was distracted with all of her preparations and she came to up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? Then tell her to help me. But the Lord answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and bothered about so many things, but only one thing is necessary, for Mary has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken away from her. Now, there are a lot of things that we could speculate on the relationship from Mary and Martha. What do we know? Was Mary given Martha a hand? No, that's what the text implied. Mary was not giving Martha a hand. Was Martha doing it all herself? Yes. That's what the text implies. That's why implication and in inference are so important. We can't draw a conclusion unless the passage implies that. Dana. What Dan has done is just uh, uh, drawn a, some possible conjecture about what was going on. 
that Martha, you know, she's upset with Mary because she never helps her. I asked you a thousand times and it didn't work, you know. So we, we can go on and on and on like that. But it sounds, it sounds relatively reasonable. It could be, it could be. But remember, this side has many could be's on the same passage. This side has only one. That's the way truth works. And that's why it's so important to us. Um, the other thing is, with respect to truth, it's a God says. It's a God says passage. But what we often hear on the, on, I would call it the conjecture side, is the phrase, I think, I think. Now, when I hear those two words, my, my antenna, I go, boing! Be, why? Because does the text just imply when what they said or referred to when they said, I think? We don't know. That's why my antenna goes up. I'm waiting to hear what's coming next. Because God expects me to make a judgment on that. So it's, 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 uh, seems to happen every time. Bing, I think, and the antenna go up. That's a, that's kind of a, kind of one of those key phrases for me. It's not wrong. Don't get me wrong. It's not wrong to say that. It just means that that's, that's something that, that's like a little bell goes off. Is what's coming truth or conjecture. That's all we have to think about. Now, the other problem is that I think does have a negative uh, stigma attached to it. If we go back to 2 Kings 5, so Naaman came with his horses and his chariots and stood at the doorway of the house of Elisha. Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, go and wash in the Jordan seven times and your flesh will be restored to you and you will be clean. Here's all you have to do, Naaman. That's it. Just go and, and wash in the Jordan. But Naaman was furious and went away and said, Behold, I thought. See, that's the negative uh, stigma that's attached to the phrase, I think. Behold, I thought. You're wrong, Naaman. You were wrong. Um, he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord, his God, and wave his hand over the place and cure the leper. That didn't happen, Naaman. That didn't happen. That's why, like I said, I think, bing, the antenna goes up because it reminds me of Naaman. Says, I, I thought it was going to happen this way. Well, it didn't, Naaman. So, like I said, it's not wrong. It's not wrong. It just means it's something we have to be careful about. To go from ch what has to happen for what is on this side of the line, conjecture, to go to this side of the line. And we know it's truth. When we get into a subject like the Holy Spirit, there's, all, there's possibilities. What does it take for the possibility to become the reality? It's going to be Scripture. It's going to be Scripture. But it's going to be particular Scripture. It's going to be um, command or directive. God has commanded it. God has told us this is the way it is. That's one, that's one way. Secondly, necessary inference. The text implies it. We can infer it. See how it works? And approved apostolic example. What are these three things? We have taught them before, and we'll teach them again. What are these three things? Ways to establish what? Bible authority. Bible authority. So, if we have something about the Holy Spirit, or something about a prophet, or something about this, or that, or whatever, to get it from this side, mentally, to this side, this is what's got to happen. That's how we establish authority. That's how we establish truth. And that's how it works. And we do that for everything. First, first uh, Corinthians 16, first two verses. 
first day of the week, how do we say there's only one option every first day of the week of the year? Necessary inference. That's what does it. That's what gets it to the truth side for us. It could be, it could be examples, yes. Acts 20 and verse 7. Correct. But because it just says do this on Sunday, mm -hmm. then we can't then we don't get to say like, well it's any good to do it this Sunday or every other Sunday as long as you do it on a Sunday, right? Like so mm -hmm. if because it says they did this on Sunday, mm -hmm. then the law then that excludes the options of first and second, right? Is that is that correct? Exactly. Yeah. It has it has with conjecture we have a lot of options. But with truth, all the options are like you said, rejected. They don't work. Uh, otherwise, God would have specified something other than the first day of the week. So, that was a good thought. I wish I could remember mine. <sighs> what was oh, I remember. When Timothy, excuse me, when Paul writes to Timothy, he asks Timothy to bring his cloak. What is that? Is that one of these three up here? What did, what did Paul just do with respect to Timothy? Gave him a what? Command. Gave him a command. But we have to be careful even about the command. Because some are specified, some are restricted to the audience to whom they're directed. And some are not. So even with respect to command slash directed, necessary inference, approved ex apostolic example, we still have to be careful. There's a lot of things the apostles did that we just we either can't do or don't apply to us. Exactly, that's where logic comes in. So now the other thing I wanted to hit before we go into the actual material on the the uh, Holy Spirit is when a word associated with something is used to refer to the thing itself. Huh? What did, what? Yeah. Where, where are you going to infer that kind of stuff, you know? That is a definition. When a word associated with something is used to refer to the thing itself. That defines the term metonymy. Metonymy. And it's very important. Because metonymy is a figure of speech, and we find it throughout, primarily, the New Testament. So we're going to have to know what it is. See how that works? If that's a figure of speech that's in the Bible over and over again, then we have to figure out why, how that works. Another one, when a word or phrase is applied to an object or action to which it is not literally applicable. You can thank Webster for this stuff. He's a, he, it was his fault. What does that define? It defines metaphor. Metaphor. Again, a figure of speech. The Bible, particularly the New Testament, is rife or the, with these figures of speech. And so we have to understand that and understand what the Bible is talking about. Both metonymy and metaphor involve the substitution of one term for another. In metaphor, this substitution is based on some specific analogy between two things, whereas in a to, uh, metonymy, the substitution is based on some understood association or contiguity. To which we respond, what did he just say? I was looking at my bookcase while I was, read, uh, while I was thinking about this. I was sitting there, I was looking at it. I got some Louis L'Amour novels in there. And my eyes rested on one of his books. And on the rear spine, it said, writing for the brand. Can you write for the brand? Literally, can you write for the brand? What's he talking about? What does he mean? Writing for the brand. He's working for somebody. Yeah, works for a ranch. 
back in Western times. When he says, writing for the brand, what's he saying? Writing for what? Okay. He's working for a ranch, and he's an employer of, of the owner of that ranch. Because every ranch has a brand. 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 So what he does, instead of saying, writing for the ranch I work for, he just says, writing for the brand. And we know what he means. We know what he means. That is metonymy. Did you have your hand up, Nolan? No, it basically answers what I... Oh, okay. Right. So what happens is the word brand is used to substitute for the real thing. It's called a metonym. Metonym. It is, it's all over the place. All over the place. Including the New Testament. He has a heart of gold. Is, is it really gold? Is it going to pump real well if it's made out of gold? No, it's not going to get any blood through her, bio, her, through her body. It's, it's something that cannot take, be taken literally. But we say it all the time. We've got a heart of gold. He's a couch potato. We know what that is. Not a real potato. It's an expression. It is a figure of speech. Those two figures of speech are metaphors. Metaphors. Like I said, the Bible uses them all the time. So when the Bible uses a, a term for something that is, is not literally possible, we've got to go in and we've got to decide, well, what is the author saying? Matthew 26 is uh, the chapter from the chapter that Blake read earlier. And when he had taken a cup of, and given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. What did he give it to them? What did he give them? What did he hand? What did Jesus hand his apostles? A what? Three letter word. A cup. What is a cup? It is a container. So he gave them a container. Full of what? Fruit of the vine. And told them divide it amongst themselves. Which is poured out, uh, my, uh, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in the Father's kingdom. Now, let's go to 1 Corinthians. I speak as to wise men, you judge what I say. Is not the cup of blessing which we bless a sharing in the blood of Christ? Is not the bread which we break a sharing in the body of Christ? Since there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. What's he talking about when he says the cup of blessing? Of what? Okay. In Matthew 26, when he said the word cup, he said container. Whereas in 1 Corinthians, I just colored purple on the carpet. Whereas with 1 Corinthians, the cup he's talking about is what? The contents. Because the cup has nothing to do with the covenant. What has to do with the covenant is the blood of Christ. That's what, what established the covenant. That's what is important. And when we partake of the Lord's Supper and we take the cup, what is important? We are taking, what are we to remember? What the cup does? What the contents do? This is metonymy. What's the value to metonymy? 1 Corinthians 11, For I received from the Lord that which I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and then, uh, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also, after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant 
in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. What's he talking about? Container or contents? Contents. No question. He's talking about the contents. That is metonymy. That's metonymy. We, we use it all the time. We use it in, in all kinds of figures of speech. That's why. See, that's why it's an important basic understanding when we get into the more complicated subjects like the Holy Spirit to figure out what he's talking about when he uses a particular term. And that's where we'll go. And right now we're out of time. So bow with me. I'll close with a word of prayer. We thank you, Father, for the word that you have provided for us, for we know that tells us how we can truly please you and how we can honor you in all that we do. We thank you that we can sit together, down together and consider your word and to study it and to be encouraged by it and ultimately be saved by it. We thank you for this, for your sacrifice, for your son's sacrifice, and we ask that you forgive us. In your son's name, amen. So I got next week to continue to make muddy water, so. <laughs> <laughs>